Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Don Boomhauer. Down in Sarasota, Florida? That's right. Don, how are you? How's the real estate business? Just fine, and business is booming. Yeah, I haven't seen you since I flew down there to do some fishing with our mutual pal, Earl Poorman. <laughs> that one, with his misguided sense of value. Now, what's that mean? Oh, his trips out to California all the time. Uh -huh. And this time, it looks as though he might stay out there. Uh, Don, I think all you Floridians are jealous of California. Now, Johnny, you think we'd ever admit it, even to ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> Be rank heresy. Anyhow, with Earl Poorman out of town, at least for a while, I'm kind of holding down the office of Tri-State Life and Casualty these days. So, what happens? Trouble. Trouble. Client's name is Thomas Patterson. All right, what's happened? Somebody knock him off or something? No, not yet. But a few years ago, when he was living up in Jacksonville... Well, Tom was the sole witness to a murder. Yeah? The killer was tried and sent to state's prison. Uh-oh. Huh? So now this killer's on the loose, and you figure Tom Patterson's life isn't worth a bag of beans. That's it, exactly. Uh, want to come down here and see what you can do about it? Nope. No, no, But, Johnny. okay, Don, I'll grab the first plane I can. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Sarasota office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the deadly debt matter. <laughs> Expense account item 17940, taxi and a plane out of Hartford. The flight was good, and by early afternoon, I was in Don Boomhauer's real estate office in Sarasota, Florida. After the usual amenities. Now, let me lay it all out for you, Johnny. Yeah, sure, Don. Go ahead. And to begin with, the life insurance policy involved has a face value of $70,000. Hmm. Let's see, then. My commission will come to, uh... Um... Don't you ever think of anything but money? Sure. Like what? Well, right now I'm thinking about the chances of staying alive. After all, with a killer on the loose, well, at least the thought of a few bucks coming to me could help me die happy. Uh, the insured's name you said is Thomas Patterson? It is now. Huh? Some years ago, Johnny, young Tommy lived up in Jacksonville, worked as a milkman. Uh-huh. Early one morning, that was in 1951, he pulled up in front of an alley just in time to see a man named Casey Carey shoot down a fellow named Harker, who just happened to be busy at the moment blasting away at Carey with a 38. Oh, so Carey pleaded self-defense, huh? Well, he tried to, but the jury wouldn't go for it. You see, there'd been a long-standing feud between the two of them. Uh -huh. Only reason they didn't give Carrie the chair is because Harker had a record as long as your arm. I see. Instead, Carrie was given ten years to life. I see. The point is that Tommy Patterson's testimony was what really convicted him. So, of course, he made the usual melodramatic threat. Oh, yeah, that he'd get Patterson if it was the last thing he ever did. He didn't care when. He'd be in no hurry. But sooner or later, he'd track him down and kill him. Mm -hmm. So what's happened? Well, Tom had just got married and started a nice little family, two boys and a girl. So Carrie's threat scared him as much because of the wife and kids as for himself. Yeah, but now, Don, you know as well as I do how little those courtroom threats usually mean. Now, now, wait. Yeah? About that time, some relative died and left Tom a considerable sum of money. So he changed his name, uh, legally. Changed it to what? To what it is now, Thomas K. Patterson. Uh, what it was before doesn't matter. Okay, go on. Then he and his family moved on down to Venice, a few miles south of here. Yeah, I remember the town. Well, there in Venice, he set up the Excellent Dairy Products Company. Nobody down here has known him as anything but Tom Patterson, so he's felt perfectly safe. Until, that is, about six months ago. Yeah? He was up in Jacksonville on a business trip. He was, uh, well, he was just walking along the street one day, turned a corner and bumped into a man coming from the other way. Uh-oh. Yes. He took one look at the man's face and started running like a scared rabbit. Casey Carey. Well, what do you think? But now, wait, Don. If Carey got ten years to life in I 1951... Know, I know, When he stopped to think about it, Tom couldn't believe it. But he went down to the public library and dug into the old newspaper files. Yeah? Sure enough, 
Thanks to good behavior, model prisoner, and all that sort of stuff... Carried got out? Carried got out. Legitimately. But to Tom Patterson, that would only mean one thing. Carrie was out to get him. In the exciting history of great American inventions and inventors, there is no one who stands out with the eminence of Thomas A. Edison. Among his hundreds of great inventions, Edison gave us the phonograph, the microphone, a telephone system, various improvements for telegraphy and motion pictures, and most significantly, the electric light or incandescent lamp, originally referred to as bottled light. When Edison was still in his 20s, he set out to invent an electric lamp which could operate on low power and would be safe for use in homes and other buildings. He knew that resistance to electricity would make wires and other substances glow for an instant with white heat, but they would be instantly consumed. So he tried several types of fiber or wire sealed in a vacuum and succeeded in producing a glow which lasted for several hours. The next step was to find a filament that would give off a bright light and last for a longer time. In his search for the right substance, which he could seal in his vacuum bulb, he tried 6,000 different substances, ranging from human hair and tar to foodstuffs and vegetable fibers. Finally, he hit upon the idea of using the fibers of the bamboo tree. Carbonized, these threads provided the filament he sought and thus the incandescent lamp became a reality. It was discovered not by accident nor by profound scientific knowledge. It was the result of tireless effort and endless trials. Edison, like so many geniuses before him, found success through determination and the philosophy which has blessed the work of most American inventors. Somehow there must be a way. Let's find it. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wait a minute, Don. Yes, Johnny? Tom Patterson wasn't sure that Carrie actually saw him, recognized him, huh? Well, at the time, no. After all, Tom had only had a very brief glimpse of the man, and the man had made no attempt to go after him. Uh-huh. But he's sure now that it was Carrie. Yes. All right, so what did he do? He drove on back to Venice, quietly bought himself a Colt 32, and got a permit to carry it. Did he tell the police why he wanted the gun? No. Of course, all along, Johnny, Tom had hoped that Carrie hadn't recognized him. But even if he had, he wouldn't know where to look for him. But, now, Don, unless this man, Kerry, has made some move against him... Now, just wait, Johnny. Okay, okay, tell it your way. A couple of months ago, Casey Carey appeared and settled down in Venice. Oh? Yes, he rented a small house and got himself a job in charge of one of the filling stations on the trail. Well, that doesn't sound as though he moved in just to carry out his threat against Tom Patterson. Needless to say, Tom tried to avoid him. But now and then, when he'd see him on the street or forget and go past the gas station, it was Kerry who'd avoid him. Pretend not to see him. Don, I know what you're thinking, Johnny. But just remember one thing. Yeah, what's that? Kerry had made it plain right from the beginning that he was in no hurry to get back in time. Ah, oh, I see. So you think he's kind of playing a cat and mouse game with him, huh? Just to build up the old fear in him, prolong the agony, maybe? What else? And believe me, he's succeeding. When Tom finally called and asked me to have you come here to protect him, he was almost a nervous wreck. All right, tell me this. Has Kerry any brains, or is he just a typical dumb hood? Well, he's in charge of a modern filling station for one of the big, important companies. All right, then he must have too much sense to commit another murder. But if he can simply wear Patterson down with fright, maybe even drive him off his rocker... Johnny, Kerry swore he'd kill Tom Patterson, and I'm convinced that he meant it. More important, Tom is. What did the police say? Well, Tom hasn't told him, in order to keep his wife and kids from finding out about it. Uh, that's a pretty small town, you know. If it weren't for his family, Tom would have just pulled up stakes and headed for Timbuktu. Don, if he's as scared as you seem to think... As I seem to And if to there's think. no good reason for it... Well? Got an extra car I can use? Yeah, sure, the yellow one parked out front. Good. Here, here. Here are the keys. All right, thanks. Well, what are you going to do? Drive on down to Venice to see Tom Patterson and the police. Item 2, 425 for a tank full of gas. In Venice, I found Tom Patterson in his office at the excellent dairy products company, about to leave for the day. What Don Boomhauer had said about him was true. He was just about beside himself with fear. 
and somewhat against his wishes, I hauled him over to police headquarters. Brad Younger, the chief, was most cooperative. But... Okay, Billy, let me know when he comes in. That's it. And yes, Mr. Dollar, I know all about Casey Carey. Oh? Then why haven't you done something about him? No, no, no. Why do you let him settle down here in Venice? Now, just a minute, Mr. Tom. If you know who he is, that he's the man who's threatened to kill me. I said just a minute, Mr. Tom. Now, you just sit there and be quiet. Yeah, please. Uh, go on with what you were saying, Chief. Mr. Johnny, I learned all about Carey from the big oil company he works for. All about him. Including that foolish thing he said in court nine years ago. All right, then. So I had a little talk with him. And we kind of kept an eye on him. Of course, only the boys on the force, and I know that. We, uh... Well, we weren't sure that Mr. Tom here knew about him being here or recognized of him. Of course I did. There was no reason to scare him or that nice family of his. Very considerate, Chief, considerate. so... Considerate? What's considerate about letting a killer settle down here in the first place? Oh, now, hold it, will you, Tom? But look here, Mr. If Tom. If you want help in this thing from me or the police or anybody of else... Of course you... I do. Why else do you think I had Mr... Boom, how our sin All right, then let us handle it our own way. But don't you Otherwise, see... Otherwise, we'll be glad to back out. Just let you take care of it all yourself. But I... Well... All right, Mr. Dollar, I... I I'm sorry. Okay. So anyhow, Mr. Johnny, I'm convinced that Casey Carey is all right. He's forgotten his threat. And I tell you that he... No, Chief. I've got to have protection against him. Somebody mm. to... Watch over me night and day. Tom, suppose Carey hasn't forgotten his threat to kill you. I'm sure he hasn't. And suppose Chief Younger were to give you protection for a while and the hope Carey might try to make for a move. a while, did you say? That's right. He said he'd be in no hurry to get me. I know and that. And he's waited nine years so far. He'll wait longer if he has to, but sooner or later he's... But... And what about my family? Uh, excuse me, Chief, uh, but here's that report you asked. Oh, okay, Billy, okay. I'll be through here in a minute. Yes, sir. Now, you're a very upset man, Mr. Tom. Well, wouldn't you be? And I see there's a pistol permit listed in your name. You have that gun on you, Mr. Tom? It's at home in my bureau. What about it? Now, don't you think it might be real sensible if you turn it in before you get excited and do something foolish? No. No, I don't. Why not, Tom? Because if you won't help me then maybe I'd better help myself. I took the chief aside and promised I'd stay with Tom Patterson, if possible, get his gun and turn it in. And Tom and I left. As we rounded the corner, we passed Carrie's gas station. Uh, no, Mr. Dollar. He's off duty this time of the evening. Oh? Uh, you know where he lives? Yes. Where? Because that's where we're going. What? Well, now, you wanted a showdown with him. Okay, now's your chance. But without my gun? You... You can't be serious. While grabbing a sandwich and some coffee, that's item three, $1.40, I managed to sell him on the idea. Then we drove on over to Carrie's house on a lonely side street. He... He must have seen me, Mr. Dollar, and he's... Probably waiting in there. Ask in the dark. Me, what... There's evil in there, mister. Ah, yes? Oh, what did you say, ma'am? And who are you, please? I'm one of the neighbors, mister. That's what. And when I heard that shot in there. You a heard while a shot? Ago, well, then I kind of thought about it for a while. And then I called the police. While we were sitting in that restaurant having. Come on, Tom. This door's open. There's got to be a light switch around here. There it is. Mr. Dollar. Huh? This is Casey Carey? Yes, sir. Only... Yeah. Shot through the head. And it looks like about a 32. Tommy, isn't that the caliber of your gun? Why, yes. And but... where did you say it is? At home, in the bureau. Now, there's no use to lie about that. Well, Chief. Chief Younger. Sorry, Mr. Tom. I'm holding you for murder. Gold is considered more precious than silver. And because it is, we find it hard to understand why silver takes precedence over gold 
in the military insignia of rank in the United States. At one time, except for the silver stars of generals worn on epaulets of gold, the color of an officer's insignia of rank depended on his branch of army service. Infantry officers wore epaulets of silver with insignia of gold. All other officers wore the opposite. In 1851, all epaulets were gold with silver insignia. But majors and second lieutenants had no insignia at all, except for a difference in size of the epaulet fringe. Between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War, most epaulets were abolished, and majors were given gold leaves to indicate their rank. But the poor second lieutenant had to wait for his gold bar until, and believe this or not, 1917. Regardless of the date of establishment, all military insignia have been a source of pride for members of the armed forces of the United States of America. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Deadly Debt Matter. That's right, Mr. Tom. I'm holding you for the murder of Mr. Casey Carey. No. No, Chief, you're wrong. Am I? Looks to me like this is his dead body laying here. And I'd guess this hole in his head was made by a 32 caliber bullet. Chief Younger, look, Mr. Listen. Tom, that's the same as this gun of yours. So, here you are, Mr. Dollar. Here's a murder weapon. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? Mr. Tom, I hate to say this, but I had a feeling you are coming to see me was a bluff. Bluff? Yes, sir. To make me think you hadn't yet done any harm to Mr. Carey here. Wrong, Chief. Am I? I had to practically drag Tom over here to see you. Well, then, let's just say he was more willing than he let on. That's not true. And when some woman phoned about hearing a shot out here and young Billy Barker came in... Barker? One of my new boys on the force. Oh. When he laid this gun on my desk and the number on it checked out against your permit, Mr. Tom... Where'd you get this gun? Right where you throwed it off to the side of the road over toward Midnight Pass. What? That's right. If young Barker hadn't stopped to fix a tire on his squad car and stepped on it, it could have laid there forever nobody the wiser. But I told you, I, I left it in my bureau at home. That just doesn't make sense now, Mr. Tom, and you know it. But it's true. So where were you after you and Mr. Johnny left me at headquarters? Well, I can I'll answer tell that, you Chief. where, Mr. Tom. You came over here and killed Mr. Carey and took the gun and threw oh, it off in the bushes. Wait, Chief Younger, listen. Yes, sir? Tom has been with me from the time we left you. Who? Yes. Well, then all that means is you killed him before you came to see me. No, no, no Chief. And when the doc digs a bullet out of Carey's body, and I take it along with your gun up to the police lab in Sarasota. Mr. Look, Dollar. And if they match up together... Tommy, it looks uh, kind of bad for you, doesn't it? Uh, no, please. Listen... You better come along with me, Mr. Tom. Maybe, maybe Chief Younger was right. And when a report came back from ballistics that the bullet had come from Tom Patterson's gun, when Tom had no way of proving he'd left the gun at home. Well, I, I still couldn't believe Tom had done it. Another thing, the neighbor woman had heard the shot only a little while before we got there. What's more, Carrie's body had still been warm. But instead of putting up a defense for Tom, I decided to play a real wild hunch that just might turn up Carrie's killer. Item three from a phone booth, 30 cents for a call to Don Boomhauer. No, Johnny, the man Tom saw Carrie murder back in 51 was named Harker. Not Barker? Nope, Gerald Harker, with an H. Well, well, then I guess my hunch about this new man in the department. Hunch about what? Oh, it's uh, nothing, Don, forget it. And thanks. Hmm... So maybe I was wrong. So maybe instead of always acting on these crazy hunches, and yet... <laughs> Item four was $1.10 for a call to Jacksonville to Mike Kirby in the city room of the Times Press. And bless him, he came up with some mighty revealing information for me. And then he worked for a while on the police force, Johnny. Oh, there in Jacksonville? That's right. Looked to me as though the boy was trying to live down the family reputation by putting himself on the side of law and order. Maybe. And a month or two ago, he handed in his badge and moved to... Hey, what was that maybe you threw in? About his being on the side of law and order? That's right. But Johnny, if he was a cop... And here's he... another maybe. What? Maybe that boy still is. What? A cop. Thanks a lot, Mike. <laughs> I 
went back to police headquarters where Chief Younger was half asleep at his desk. I told him I wanted to have a little talk with one of his men. Now, Mr. Johnny, but it's after midnight, and he doesn't come on duty until late in the morning. But okay, if you insist, I'll call him, get him out of bed, and have him come down here. And then about half an hour later, they're in Chief Younger's office. Something special, Chief, get me out of bed this way? Billy, I want you to meet Johnny Dollar. Mr. Johnny, this is Billy Barker. Hi, Billy. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Only, uh... Why did you change your name from Harker when you came down here to Venice? Huh? What? What's that, sir? I'm afraid it was a dead giveaway. Uh, I don't know what you mean, sir. I'm sure I don't. That and the fact you didn't move down here until Casey Carey did. Oh, you, you mean that man that was killed this afternoon? That's right. The man who'd killed your own father back in 51. Is that true, Billy? How did you know, Mr. Dollar? Casey Carey, the man you swore you'd someday get even with for killing your dad. How did you know that? I didn't. I was guessing. Looks to me like you guessed right, Mr. Johnny. Now, now look... When you learned that Carey was getting out of jail, you joined the force up there, hoping that maybe you could find some excuse to kill him in line of duty. You don't know... But before you could do it, he moved down here to Venice. So you followed him and joined the force down here. You, you think that's the reason I came down and here? All you could do was bide your time. Until this afternoon, when you heard us talking in here and found out about Tommy Patterson recognizing Gary, being so wild with fear that he was willing to kill him. Now, you listen So all you me. had to do was get hold of Tommy's gun. I don't know how or when. That's beside the point. Mr. Johnny, are you sure of this? I'm not sure of anything, Chief. You bet you are. But if Billy is willing to go over to the police lab in Sarasota, let them make a paraffin test of his shooting hand. Well, Billy... All right, you two... Oh, you don't do it! Chief, you... You want to let Tom Patterson out of that cell so he can go home to his family? Yes, sir. Right away. And thank you, Mr. Johnny. Expense account total, including our motel room, some fishing out in the Gulf with Chief Younger the next day. Then the flight back to Hartford. Call it $200 even. Remarks? The fishing was great. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Russell Thorson, Barney Phillips, Sam Edwards, Bert Holland, and Stacey Harris. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.